I'm here to argue the point that a robotic sacral copopexy is the best operation for apical prolapse repair and probably the best overall operation for um, pelvic organ prolapse. And I'm going to be sensitive to the fact that not everybody here necessarily does uh, a lot of prolapse repair, so I will go through some of the background uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, I have one relevant uh, disclosure that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. So as far as the evolution of prolapse repair, um, we've learned over the years that the repair of the vaginal apex is really the most important component of the repair. If you fail to suspend the apex at the top of the vagina, then you're going to get failure in the anterior and posterior vaginal compartments. And the provision of apical support uh, has actually evolved uh, over time. So uh, in the early days, and I still do these frequently, all, we all do, uh, we typically went a tr had a transvaginal approach, uh, fixing the vaginal apex to the sacrospinous ligament in the pelvis, and this can be done all transvaginally. Additionally, uh, an alternative approach was, particularly at the time of vaginal hysterectomy, was to fix the vaginal apex to the uterosacral ligaments uh, after they're ligated uh, from the hysterectomy. So these are both native tissue pairs and uh, kind of pre uh, predate the sort of mesh era. Now, uh, we quickly discovered that a sacral copalpexy or a procedure using mesh to support the vaginal apex had much higher success rates than native tissue pairs, and so it was the use of this mesh that seemed to increase the success rate. Unfortunately, the open sacral copalpexy is clearly more invasive and cannot be done transvaginally. So then we got the idea, well, this mesh is great stuff. It has higher success than native tissue pairs. So why don't we try doing that transvaginally? Because it's less invasive than an abdominal operation. So it became very popular. We we're, we're all lived through this um, in, in, the, you know, in the early 2000s that we were doing transvaginal mesh repairs. And this led to the transvaginal mesh crisis of the mid-2010s, uh, where Dr. Walter and I spent a lot of our time removing uh, mesh from patients. And so then there's now been a return, a resurgence of the sacral copalpexy as an operation. Sacral copalpexy mesh, as we said, can't be placed transvaginally. Um, and we know that when mesh is placed to the abdominal root, it has much fewer complications than the transvaginal root. In fact, this type of mesh has fallen outside of all the FDA mesh warnings from the very beginning. It was never pulled from the market. But now we have the advantage of laparoscopic and robotic approaches to this operation, offering the high success rate of a mesh abdominal sacral copalpexy but in a much more minimally invasive fashion than open surgery. And it's now become a very good alternative to transvaginal mesh because of that. And we can, indeed, we can see that going from 2008, and this is old data, 2008 to 2011, if we follow the dotted line, the use of laparoscopic and robotic sacral copalpexy has simply climbed as we went through the, uh, the mesh crisis of the mid-2010s. So why robotic sacral copalpexy? So an open sacral copalpexy, we know, has a high success rate and has a durable operation, but it's more invasive. The laparoscopic sacral copalpexy is less invasive with equivalent success as the open approach, but unfortunately has a steep learning curve. It requires an experienced camera assistant, and unfortunately, in an operation that involves a lot of not tying intracorporeally, it's difficult to do that straight laparoscopy. And so now this is a perfect setup to do robotic sacral copalpexy, where we had the advantages of the laparoscopic approach without that steep learning curve, particularly with respect to suture placement, knot tying, and the improved visualization, and also another advantage is the surgeon himself or herself controls the camera. Robotic sacral copalpexy has high success rates, and it's becoming the current gold standard for apical prolapse, uh, apical pelvic organ prolapse, because as we said, apical supports the most important part. The robotic sacral copalpexy does this exceptionally well. Looking at the pooled meta-analysis data, it has 98.6% apical success rate, defined as POPQ stage less than one. And it also has low reoperation rates, less than 1% for apical prolapse and 2.5% for non-apical prolapse, that is, cystocele or rectocele. And these are mostly rectoceles where the mesh can't reach. This is highly favorable compared to the overall reoperation rates for all pelvic organ prolapse repairs, which lies somewhere between 10 and 30%, depending on the repair. It's also a very durable repair. We know uh, that success rate for all prolapse repairs declines over time, but sacral copalpexy is one of the best. 
It's the open procedure is very durable with a 78% success rate with seven years of follow-up. And the robotic sacral copoplexy seems to be the same, 78% success at six years of follow-up. And all the recurrences in that cohort were either rectocele's or cystocele's with no reoperations for recurrent apical prolapse. Now, when we compare robotic sacral copoplexy with uterosacral ligament suspension, looking at the meta-analysis data, it suggests good success rates and low rates of complication. The problem is a lot of these studies have short follow-up. Uterosacral ligament suspension with longer follow-up had higher failure rates than sacral copoplexy. Somewhere between 17 to 24% had about two years of follow-up, compared to only 1.4% during the same duration of follow-up for robotic sacral copoplexy. Now, there's not a whole lot of data comparing directly robotic sacral copoplexy with robotic uterosacral ligament suspension, so we'll have to rely on some of the laparoscopy data instead. And looking at a comparative study by Campana and colleagues in 2022, um, it was a case control study of laparoscopic uterosacral ligament suspension versus the sacral copoplexy with stage two or greater prolapse. And I include this table to emphasize that the prolapse was actually worse from the start in the sacral copoplexy group. Looking at their uh, outcomes at a mean 22 months of follow-up, we see this line here that there is greater failure over time for the uterosacral ligament suspension compared to the sacral copoplexy group. In fact, that turned out to be 32% failure in uterosacral ligament suspension versus 6.3 in sacral copoplexy. And when we looked at the subjective data, there was a much higher uh, rate of people saying they were very much better or much better in the sacral copoplexy group compared to the uterosacral ligament suspension group. So better objective and subjective success. Additionally, it looks like if you have higher stages of prolapse that the mineral invasive sacral copoplexy is actually better as well because the odds ratio for failure is higher in the uterosacral ligament suspension group. Going back to the data of Campana and colleagues, there was no significant difference in the perioperative complication rates as well. So laparoscopic sacral copoplexy has superior outcomes compared to laparoscopic uterosacral ligament suspension. I'll, I'll grant that it has a longer operative time, but that comes with higher objective and subjective success. Additionally, there's no significant difference in complication rates, despite an overall worse degree of prolapse in the sacral copoplexy group. We also have randomized data showing that laparoscopic and robotic sacral copoplexy have equivalent objective and subjective success rates and perioperative complications, with the exception that robotic approach is longer and has higher cost. Now, what about ureteral injury? Historically, uterosacral ligament suspension has about a 10% risk of injuring the ureter. However, we know now that the laparoscopic approach is actually much less risk. In fact, ureteral injury is, is essentially zero compared to the transvaginal approach at uterosacral ligament suspension. And I will grant that when we do the laparoscopic or robotic approach, we can probably eliminate ureteral injury as, as a major risk uh, in this era. And speaking of complication rates, um, they're roughly the same between a uterosacral ligament suspension and a sacral copoplexy, with the exception of mesh complications. And mesh complications following sacral copoplexy are actually relatively low. This is one of the reasons it was never uh, included in the FDA warnings on mesh. And a large survey of over 700 patients with long follow-up, six and a half years of follow-up, Mesh or suture exposure was about 3.6%, and operation for that was about 4%. So the modern lightweight monofilament meshes that we use are different from the meshes of old and much safer. There's also the option of non-mesh sacral copoplexy. Mesh-averse patients can opt for tissue-based sacral copoplexy uh, using cadaveric fascia lata versus mesh at five years follow-up. Mesh had 97% success, and, and cadaveric fascia had 90% subjective success. But when we look at the objective data, unfortunately, the cadaveric tissue has a lower success rate. And so due to that poor objective success of cadaveric fascia lata, there has been a resurgence into the use of autologous fascia lata for sacral copoplexy in this post-transvaginal mesh era. And so I'm just going to cite two studies here. One is our own, uh, which is 34 patients undergoing autologous repair. Uh, via the open and robotic approaches, and we had no treatment failures at 13 months of follow-up. 
a similar study by Bach and colleagues compared mesh versus uh, autologous robotic sacrocopalpexy, and at a mean follow-up of 12 months, they did not have a significant difference in objective success rates and only a 2% mesh exposure rate. So autologous sacrocopalpexy seems to have equivalent outcomes to mesh in the short term. Uh, granted, there's longer operative time involved than the mesh repair. So in summary, uh, robotic sacrocopalpexy is a better long-term uh, has better long-term success rates than uterocycle ligament suspension. This is especially true for higher stages of prolapse. It has equivalent complication rates to the sacral ligament suspension, with the exception of mesh exposure, knowing that the mesh exposure rates are relatively low with modern meshes and non-mesh options are available for patients who are mesh averse. Sacral copalpexy has withstood the test of time as the highest success rate operation for prolapse. And robotic sacrocopalpexy at this point in time remains the single best mineral invasive intervention for prolapse with the highest chance of patient success and avoidance of retreatment. Thanks for your attention.